the building in Dover and the manufacturing in Dover, and I hate to see all our fields uh, no longer with the livestock. They are now factories. I just hate to see all the green grass being cemented over and built up. The added traffic, I, probably that is the thing that I, I would notice the most, uh, uh, trying to go down Central Avenue and, and uh, getting stuck in traffic for a while. And you don't usually anticipate that kind of thing in, in Dover, New Hampshire. You might expect it in Boston, Mass., but not Dover, New Hampshire. One thing that uh, affects my life personally is the change in Pinkpo, uh, where you had a uh, almost a small country city uh, atmosphere at one time. Now it's getting more cosmopolitan. And uh, going down the street, you just don't seem to meet the faces uh, that you did uh, when you first came here. Growth in the past years has been tremendous. I think I'm a little bit saddened because I like to see the things as they were. Dover is growing and changing, but this isn't the first time the city has grown and changed, nor is it the first time Dover has faced a challenge. After all, a city that's more than 365 years old has faced many challenges over the years. Dover is a city with over three and a half centuries of experience. It's a survivor. And its history is one of its most important assets. Having a sense of that history is essential to understanding Dover in the present, and it provides important clues about Dover's future. The most important element in Dover's history is the water. In 1623, a group of fishermen, fishmongers as they were called in those days, traveled from the ocean up the Piscataqua River to a place we now call Dover Point. They established New Hampshire's first permanent settlement, 50 years before New Hampshire would technically become New Hampshire. The original Penacook Indian name was Wakana Cohunt. Later, the settlement was known as Hilton's Point. Then it was called The Neck, Bristol, Northam, and finally Dover in the 1640s. Edward and William Hilton, along with a small company of men and their families were financed by the Laconia Company, a group of businessmen in England, to come to the New World and set up a fishery and to trade with the Indians. They were very impressed with our Dover Point. We could hardly have found a more inviting place than the Point, either for fishing or planting or trading with the Indians, and for safety, no resort could have been better than this narrow neck of land from which, by our boats, there is such immediate means of escape, if escape should at any time be necessary. Living in crude log houses of one or two rooms with block windows and bare earth floors, the settlers survived, but only barely. In fact, that was Dover's first challenge, survival. Here's an excerpt from a letter written in 1629 by one of the early settlers, Ambrose Gibbons. He was writing to his sponsors back in England. For myself, my wife and my child, and four men, we have but a half a barrel of corn. And beef, I have not had one piece this three months. I nor the servants have neither money nor clothes. In 1633, the settlement expanded with the arrival of the ship James carrying goods and more settlers from England. Some of the names of the earliest settlers are still familiar today. Thomas Whitehouse, Robert Varney, John Tuttle, Thomas Layton, James Newt, Richard Waldern, Hadeville Nutter, John Hall, Thomas Roberts, and more. As the Dover settlement grew, the settlers gradually developed interests farther up the Cochico River. In 1642, Major Richard Waldron set up a sawmill here at the Lower Falls. 
With his brother William, he began a lumber and shipbuilding trade, shipping local products as far as the West Indies and England. Even though there was a sawmill here in 1642, this area was still considered the wilderness frontier. It would take another 150 years for the center of town to move this far upriver. Life flowed on at the Dover Point settlement. They fished, traded with the Indians, built ships and harvested timber, and they had to deal with the problems of their growing community, both big and small. As for the small problems, here's an example from the town records, July 10th, 1645. John Baker is hereby fined 10 shillings for drawing his sword and running after Indians with it drawn. He is also admonished for trading with the Indians on the Sabbath day and is hereby ordered to pay two shillings sixpence fees. He is further presented for beating Richard Nason so that he was black and blue and for throwing a fire shovel at his wife. Fine, five shillings. It seems that Mr. Baker was quite a handful. In fact, he was probably a candidate for some stern counseling from the Congregational Minister. The church was an important part of the early settlers' lives. The state, or congregational church, was the only religious institution in Dover until the unwanted arrival of the Quakers in 1663. Although severely persecuted at first, the strangely silent Quakers eventually established quite a following in Dover. They had a good deal of influence on Dover's history. The Quakers and the Congregationalists remained the only religious groups in Dover for the next 150 years. As for the settlers' larger problems, Indian troubles. Even though Dover had developed a peaceful relationship with the local Panacook Indians, the growing Indian wars to the north and south eventually flared up here in Dover. This entry from the town records in 1675 shows the growing problem with the Indian wars, a problem which became Dover's next challenge. Two houses belonging to two persons named Chesley at Oyster River were attacked and burned by Indians. Two men in a canoe were killed and two made prisoner, both of whom soon after made their escape. A few days later, five or six houses were also burned at Oyster River by the Indians, and William Roberts and his son-in-law were killed. To make reprisals for these daring and murderous assaults, about 20 young men, chiefly of Dover, obtained leave of Major Waldron, commander of the militia, to try their skill and courage with the Indians in their own way. It was on this site, along what is now Chestnut Street, that Dover's infamous sham battle occurred one year after the Oyster River attacks. As mentioned before, Dover citizens had no quarrel with the local Penacook tribe. In fact, Major Waldron had negotiated a treaty with Juana Lancet, chief of the Penacooks, just that year. But outside forces, both Indian and colonial, would combine to destroy Dover's hard-won peace with the local natives. After the treaty was signed, on Major Waldron's invitation, several hundred Indians came up from the south and joined with the local Penacooks to escape the wars and to benefit from Chief Wana Lancet's influence with the local white settlers. But on the 6th of September, 1676, Two companies of Massachusetts soldiers came through Dover on orders to seize all Indians who had been concerned in the wars. The soldiers would have killed the Indians as soon as they met if Major Waldron had not dissuaded them from that course of action and instead contrived a plan to provide a bloodless method of capturing the visiting Indians from the south. He proposed a sham battle after the English tradition with his men and the two Massachusetts companies on one side and the Indians on the other. After causing the Indians to fire the first volley, 
they immediately surrounded the Indians, seizing them and disarming them without a loss of men on either side. Wana Lancet and the local Penacooks were peaceably dismissed, but the visiting Indians from the south were taken prisoner and sent back to Boston, where seven were condemned to hang and the rest were sold into slavery. It was this sham battle which sparked Dover's infamous Indian Massacre 13 years later. On the night of June 27, 1689, a large group of Indians attacked the five garrisons located around the falls. Several of the Indians who had been captured in the sham battle 13 years earlier had managed to escape from slavery and return to Dover, where they kindled the local Indians' thirst for revenge. The garrisons and the saw and grist mills were burned, and the whites were massacred. 29 died, and 23 more were taken prisoner and carried off to Canada. It is alleged that Major Waldron was tortured to death at his own kitchen table in front of his family. Mary Otis, a Quaker child living in one of the garrisons burned that night, gives this account of the massacre. On that terrible night of June 27th, Grandpa allowed two Indian squaws to stay in the yard. Sometime after midnight, they unbolted the gate and let a lot of braves in, half drunk and crazy mad against all white people. They killed Grandpa as he was getting out of bed. One of them shot my father. Another picked up Hannah, my half-sister, and dashed her brains out on the chimney. Then they set fire to the house and started off for Canada with the rest of us. I was rescued at Conway and brought back home, but I never saw my two brothers again. Indian troubles plagued the settlers for the next 35 years. So the garrisons which surrounded the city were an important part of Dover's survival on the wilderness frontier. Despite Indian troubles, the settlers gradually expanded their interests upriver, building sawmills and brickyards further north along the shore. The town center moved northward too. By 1712, the town center had moved as far inland as Pine Hill, where a new meeting house was built. The area is now Pine Hill Cemetery. And by the late 1700s, the town center had moved even farther north to Tuttle Square now the intersection of Silver Street and Central Avenue. It was about this time that talk of revolution was heard. 1773 was the year of the Boston Tea Party, a protest against unfair British taxation. By 1775, the American Revolution had begun. Dover's citizens were deeply involved in the War of Independence. This is from the town record, June 3, 1775. Thirty-one companies of soldiers were raised in New Hampshire at this time and marched to Medford, Massachusetts to reinforce General Sullivan. The company raised in Dover constituted the 18th, John Waldron, Captain, Ebenezer Ricker, First Lieutenant, and John Goodwin, Second Lieutenant. The Reverend Jeremy Belknap was chosen by Dover's Committee of Safety to serve as chaplain for the New Hampshire troops stationed in the vicinity of Boston. This is from the Dover Town Records of October 1781. The siege and surrender of Yorktown, the crowning event of the War of the Revolution, was concluded this month, at which the gallant Colonel Scammell, one of the bravest and most distinguished officers of the war, who went from Durham in command of a New Hampshire regiment, was foully murdered by the enemy. By the time the war ended in 1783, the Reverend Belknap reported that the number of soldiers lost in the War of the Revolution from New Hampshire was 1,400. From Dover, 29. In 1790, seven years after the Revolutionary War, in this house on what is now Silver Street, Dr. Ezra Green established Dover's first post office. It was a sign that Dover was prospering and attracting many newcomers. But at the same time, Dover was approaching its next challenge. Here's a surprising entry from the Dover Town Records, July 5th, 1792. We are informed from good authority 
that a canal is to be dug from Winnipesaukee Pond to unite the waters with the Kachiko River, and that a subscription is filling out for that purpose. Why would Dover want to build a canal from Lake Winnipesaukee to the Kochiko River? Timber was the mainstay of Dover's economy, and the local supply was rapidly dwindling. Dover faced another challenge. The canal connecting Lake Winnipesaukee with the Kochiko River would provide affordable access to the rich supply of timber in New Hampshire's interior. The canal never materialized, but another solution did. The Piscataqua Bridge. Built in 1794, a technological marvel in its time, the bridge spanned a half mile across Great Bay from Durham to Newington via Rock and Goat Islands. There was even a tavern on Goat Island where the traveler could stop and examine the bridge close up. The bridge eventually connected to a newly constructed toll road on the Durham side. This toll road, today known as Route 4, stretched 36 miles from Durham to Concord and provided access to the farms and forests in New Hampshire's interior. A new city was also planned at the junction of the bridge and the toll road. It was to be called Franklin City in honor of patriot Benjamin Franklin. Some of Dover's prominent citizens even bought speculative lots there. But like the canal, the new city never progressed further than the planning stages, except for a few small warehouses. But the bridge, which lasted until 1855, and the new toll road fulfilled their purpose. Dover area merchants had succeeded in saving their timber-based economy. The lumber industries had provided the base for Dover's prosperity for many, many years, from the earliest beginnings at Waldron's sawmill until the beginning of the cloth mill era in the early 1800s. The early 1800s were a time of local investment. Some failed, but some foreshadowed Dover's future. And again, the center of Dover moved northward this time to an area known as the Landing. Located below the lower falls on a bend in the river, the Landing area developed into a bustling trade center. Much of the riverfront property in the Landing area was originally owned by the town. As the land increased in value, the select men were able to sell and lease lots in order to finance various municipal projects. This sparked a period of social improvement in Dover. A new courthouse was built on Tuttle Square. A bridge was built over the Bellamy River, providing easier access to the new Piscataqua Bridge and the toll road to Concord. And Dover's first social library was begun. Here's a document verifying the Reverend Jeremy Belknap's admittance to the library in 1776. The landing lots also paid for a fire society. The members were instructed to keep leather buckets and cloth bags. Leather buckets because they were fire resistant and less dangerous if they fell on someone's head below. And cloth bags to scoop up the valuables, usually linen, silverware and dishes. Finally, in 1800, with rental money from the landing lots, Dover purchased its first fire engine. Dover was becoming more sophisticated as the town center settled in around the rapidly developing landing area. But Dover didn't know its next challenge was already brewing out on the high seas. Britain was again at war with France, and America's trading ships had become pawns in the strategy games between the two countries. In 1807, a shipping embargo was imposed on all American ships by President Jefferson in hopes of forcing England and France to leave our ships alone. Since Dover had prospered by freely trading goods with the rest of the world, the embargo and our eventual involvement in the War of 1812 placed a very heavy strain on the local economy. 
the resourceful area merchants thought they had solved the transportation problems of the lumber industries. Bridges and roads had been constructed, ships were built, and gundalows traveled up and down the river, delivering goods and supplies to and from the larger ships in Portsmouth. Everything seemed to be in place. But now they faced a challenge over which they had no control. Their frustration seemed to erupt in Dover's political arena. A deep split developed between the major political parties. On one side were Dover's Republicans, the ruling party in Dover, as well as in the country. The Republicans were made up of Dover's liberal factions, Quakers, who accounted for more than a third of the population by then, and the new families, drawn to Dover by its growing business opportunities. The Republican Party, led by President Jefferson, was also responsible for the unpopular shipping embargo, as well as U.S. involvement in the War of 1812. On the other side were the Federalists, the conservative faction, made up of Dover's old families, lawyers, wealthy merchants, and clergy. They saw the unpopular embargo and the war as an opportunity to recruit new members and build the strength of the Federalist Party. The lines were drawn between the liberal Republicans and the conservative Federalists. Times were rough in the early 1800s. The economy was poor, the political environment was tense, and lots of new families were coming to Dover to work and live, changing the nature of its population and placing strains on the support structures of the town. But the war was actually sowing the seeds for the solution to the challenge of Dover's declining timber industry. By 1810, the various falls of the Cochico River were lined with small wooden carting and fulling mills that produced low-quality cloth. These mills greatly increased their business during the war, when imported cloth was no longer available from Great Britain. In 1811, a new dimension was added to the potential of these enterprising mills along the Cochico, when William Briggs, an Irish immigrant with knowledge of small hand looms, ran the following ad in the sun. Weaving in its various branches, William Briggs, late from Ireland, flatters himself that he shall interest the attention of a generous public and that the manufacturers of America will find encouragement as well in the northern as in the southern states. As William Briggs became established in town, some of Dover's prominent citizens began to see the great potential of a local cotton industry. In 1812, a group of Dover's leading citizens, both Republicans and Federalists, met in this house on Silver Street, then known as the Fish and Potato Club at the Dame Tibbetts Tavern. They signed an agreement to charter the Dover Cotton Factory. Dover's mill era had begun. By 1815, the Dover Cotton Factory had been erected. It was a wooden structure, 100 feet long, three stories high, and 32 feet wide. It was built on the Cochico Upper Falls, about two miles upriver, because the lower falls were already occupied by Daniel Waldron's sawmill. Times were not easy for the young company. It was starting up at the same time the War of 1812 ended, just as cloth from Great Britain began to flood back into the local market. The cotton factory was lucky to survive the Depression years following the War of 1812. However, by 1817, things had picked up, and a new period of prosperity began for the mills, as well as another cycle of social improvement in Dover. There evolved a concern for the care of the sick, championed by Dover's leading surgeon, Dr. Jabez Dow, founder of the Dover Chemical Society in 1818. The legislature granted a charter to a group of Dover citizens for the Stratford Agricultural Society. It was formed for the purpose of promoting useful improvements in agriculture and domestic manufacture. The society held agricultural fairs for a number of years. In 1818, the Franklin Academy, a private school on Waldron Street, was dedicated for the blessings of religious, moral, literary, and scientific education. And even the political climate settled down, with the Republicans back in control after a brief period of Federalist popularity. 
New churches began to appear too, beginning with the Methodists, after the Toleration Act of 1819. The act eliminated the requirement that all citizens support the Congregational Church. And even the Panic of 1819, one of the worst years of depression the country had ever seen, did not seem to hit Dover very hard. In 1821, the owners of the cotton factory gained control of the land at the Lower Falls and constructed a new brick mill called Number 2. Then, in 1823, with enlarged capital, the company changed its name to the Dover Manufacturing Company and had built four more huge mills at the falls by 1826. The local owners then sold much of their interest to a group of Boston investors, and in 1827, the company was reincorporated as the Cochico Manufacturing Company. In just 25 years, the small group of incorporators who had invested $50,000 in the establishment of the Dover Cotton Factory had changed the face of Dover. The mill tower bell could be heard all over town six days a week at 5 a.m. and 6 p.m., signaling the beginning and end of each workday. And as the mills expanded, their influence on the town expanded too. The population of Dover doubled between the years of 1820 and 1830. Many young women found work in the mills, and businessmen saw opportunities to provide services to the mills as well as to the increasing population. Young girls from the surrounding countryside would come into town and work in the mills for two or three years, long enough to help their families build up a dowry so the girls could get married. Since the parents of these young women were concerned about their safety, the girls usually stayed at one of the boarding houses run by the mill. A matron hired by the mill would run the house and enforce strict rules of conduct. The company requests that all persons be punctual in their attendance at one of the churches in town, so that all may acquire and maintain the respect of the community. The mills also attracted new waves of immigrants, mostly Irish, but also many English workers who were skilled in the weaving, engraving, and printing trades. David, Noah, Andrew, Zephi, Caleb, Joshua, Jess, and Benji, Jensen, Rhoda, John, and Nisa, and Abby are our names. So the character of Dover was changing as well as its geography. And as Dover was trying to deal with this huge influx of strangers, it was also in the midst of a strong temperance movement, a feminist movement, and the anti-slavery movement. And all of this was happening amidst a growing desire for worldly pleasures. Dover again faced a challenge, integrating all of the newcomers into the community during a period of almost unbounded growth and social activism. The shout of Washingtonians is heard on every gale. They're chanting now the victory or cider, beer, and ale. Recognizing this need, Dover citizens formed many voluntary societies. And a strong religious movement, coupled with the population growth, provided fertile ground for the founding of new churches. By 1834, there were eight churches in town. And now they are a temperate crew and have given the devil his due. Meanwhile, the prospering Cuchico Manufacturing Company now had mill buildings strung along the south bank of the river below the falls. And in the 1840s, they expanded from the manufacture of cotton to the printing of fashionable calicos as well at the printery complex located in what is now Henry Law Park. In fact, the mills were doing so well, they needed to look for ways to improve their transportation system. The gundalos, which had been around since the 1650s transporting local goods such as cordwood and marsh hay, were also used by the mills. They transported cargoes to and from the large ocean-going ships and coastal packet vessels, which, because of their size and the shallowness of the Cochico River, couldn't come all the way up to Dover. This extra and costly step was just one of the problems with the 1830s transportation system, one which brought raw materials into Dover and took finished products out to ports all over the world. 
The mills and the town came up with a three-part plan. All were tied to Dover's most precious resource, the water. One part of the plan revived the old canal from Lake Winnipesaukee to the Kachiko River. This time the canal would be used in both directions. The mills could expand their markets into New Hampshire's interior and bring raw materials out on the return trip. Another part of the scheme was to expand the regular packet ship service between Dover and Boston to help get the finished products out more quickly. And the final part of the plan called for dredging the Kuchiko River, digging the riverbed deeper, straightening narrow curves, and hauling out submerged boulders so that the larger ships could come all the way up the river into Dover. The canal, once again, never made it past the planning stage. But the Dover to Boston packet service was improved substantially. In 1838, 97 vessels arrived in Boston from Dover. And the dredging plan survived too. The first dredging of the Cochico was begun in 1836 with the aid of a $10,000 grant from the federal government. But there was a downside to the dredging. It forced a decline in the number of gundalows since they were no longer used to unload ships downriver. Once again, they were relegated to the transportation of local goods and supplies. Their business dropped off sharply. Meanwhile, the mills were still booming, but the boom times also caused unrest and frustration among the mill workers. In 1828, the management of the Cochico Manufacturing Company earned the dubious honor of precipitating the nation's first women's strike. Hear the mighty car wheels humming, down about the engines coming. The strike and general worker unrest were caused mostly by absentee ownership and unenlightened management, which cared little for the individual worker. This unrest plagued the company for years. In March of 1834, the women struck the company again. 700 women employees of the Cochico Manufacturing Company were convinced that the Boston owners of the company were attempting to make them factory slaves. The women tried to recruit other women from neighboring mills, and they formed a strike fund. Both tactics were later used by the giant unions. Finally, in November of 1834, nine months after it began, the strike ended. The women's wages were raised. In December, the hard-nosed but exhausted mill agent James F. Curtis resigned. He took a job with the Boston and Worcester Railroad Company. Moses Paul, nephew of John Williams, the founder and original mill agent, replaced James Curtis. And conditions at the Cochico Manufacturing Company gradually improved due to Paul's benevolent management techniques. Just a few years earlier, another Dover landmark was established. The Sawyer Woolen Mill was built on the south side of Dover in 1824 on the Bellamy River. Alfred I. Sawyer was the founder. Soon the Sawyer Mills were busy building a national reputation, first for flannels, later cashmeres, and finally worsted yarns. With the arrival of the railroad in 1842, Dover's transportation structure was changed dramatically. The Boston and Maine Railroad Company eventually loosened the Garrison City's 200-year-old partnership with the river. As the railroad pushed west to Alton, the concept of a Winnipesaukee Canal faded forever. The coming of the railroad also changed the location of Dover's center over the years, again moving it northward to Franklin Square, away from the landing and closer to the railroad station on 3rd Street. And by the early 1900s, the gundalows and even the packet ships succumbed to the expansion of the railroad lines. In March of 1860, a Republican presidential candidate from Illinois visited Dover. His name was Abe Lincoln. In November of that year, he was elected president. The voting in Dover was overwhelmingly in his favor. But in less than a year, the country was at war, this time with itself. The Civil War, the North fighting against the South. 
1861, the mayor of Dover was authorized to purchase and present a revolver to each citizen who enlisted in the Union Army. Unfortunately, since the soldiers relied on their rifles more than their revolvers, the revolvers were often tossed into a field to lighten the load on the long, weary marches. The Dover families of the volunteers in the war were given free medical services by the doctors of the Stratford Medical Association. And more than 100 Dover women met at the vestry of the Congregational Church, armed and equipped with needles and sewing machines to make 400 flannel shirts for the volunteers. By April of 1861, Dover recruits numbered 220. As the war was coming to an end in 1865, President Lincoln was elected to a second term. The bells of Dover were rung, and a national salute was fired in his honor. And finally, on April 13, 1865, news about the end of the war reached Dover. It was reported in the Dover Inquirer. The glorious news of General Lee's surrender was announced to our citizens by a telegraphic dispatch at the American Line office, creating the wildest enthusiasm and the most intense rejoicing throughout the city. The factory bell pealed forth the joyous news, and other bells soon followed suit. Stores were closed, schools dismissed, and business was suspended. Two days later, news of President Lincoln's assassination reached Dover. The city was deeply shocked. On April 19, 1865, the National Day of Mourning, Dover's bells tolled for several hours, and gun salutes were fired every 30 minutes all day long. Dover's reliance on the water continued to decline. The only water-based transportation system which survived, actually it was revived after the Civil War, was the fleet of the Dover Navigation Company. Incorporated in 1878, it had 10 coastal schooners carrying lumber and coal between Dover and ports up and down the Atlantic coast. After the second phase of dredging was completed in the late 1870s, the Dover port was finally accessible to huge schooners. They were able to compete with the railroad by carrying the heavy loads of coal and other supplies needed by Dover's larger businesses. The Cochico Manufacturing Company, C.H. Tricky and Sons, a coal and wood supply business, and the Dover Gas Light Company were great consumers of thousands of tons of coal delivered by the schooners. Back in 1855, the growing town of Dover had voted to charter itself a city and elected its first mayor. But with the expansion of the railroad, Dover's growth was focused on the land, not on the water. Even with the short revival of shipping later in the century, the docks and wharves at the landing area on Cochico Street declined as Dover's reliance on shipping slipped away. A natural disaster struck Dover in 1896. It changed the geography of the downtown area and sounded the death knell for the shipping industry at the landing. As you see here, the Bracewell block of stores used to stretch all the way across the Cochico River. On March 1st, 1896, six bridges and four stores with all their stock were swept away by a raging Cochico River during a devastating winter storm that caused fires and floods all along the coast. That day went down in Dover history as Dover's Black Day. The flood also decimated the past 60 years of dredging done on the Cochico. The great ships would never be able to come back to Dover. The flood also seems to have fostered a negative attitude about the river. It wasn't long after the flood that the river was fenced off in some places, and people began to throw their trash into it. The community lost interest in the river. They saw no value in it. And that attitude prevailed until the 1970s.
Just about a decade before the flood, Dover's trolley lines were laid in place. It's interesting to note that the electric railroad was invented by a Dover citizen. At the Dover Town Hall on October 6, 1847, Professor Moses Garish Farmer gave a first-in-the-nation demonstration of his electromagnetic engine. It was destined to become the subway and trolley systems of the next century. Dover's first line was the Dover Horse Railroad Company. A Dover woman named Mary Dow took control of this company in 1888 and pleased the riding public by lowering the fare from six cents to five cents. It's reported that Mary Dow was the only woman in the world at that time who was president of a railroad company. Mrs. Dow sold the line to Henry Burgett in 1889. Burgett electrified the railway and extended it from Franklin Square to Summersworth's Central Park. By the turn of the century, the Dover, Summersworth, and Rochester Street Railway was also able to connect with lines to Portsmouth and York Beach. The electric trolley lines served Dover and the surrounding area for 36 years. The last electric trolley made its final trip from Dover in 1926, replaced by the bus and the automobile. By the beginning of the 20th century, the Cochico Manufacturing Company had grown even more. The past 25 years had been busy ones, and the Irish and English workers had been succeeded by French Canadian, Greek, and Lebanese immigrants. There were over 1,200 employees operating 128,000 spindles. But in 1907, mill number one of the Cochico Manufacturing Company burned. And even though it was rebuilt, the fire signaled the beginning of a slow decline for the mills in Dover. It was brought on by rising costs, stronger union demands, and worn out machinery. In 1909, the mills changed ownership again. The Pacific Mills of Lawrence, Massachusetts bought the Cochico Manufacturing Company. The mills continued to operate, but on a smaller scale. The printery was torn down in 1913. And although business was brisk during World War I, it wasn't permanent. In the 1930s, Pacific Mills, like many of the mills in New England, was in dire need of new facilities. The company decided to start fresh with brand new facilities in the union-free, labor-cheap environment of the South. The manufacturing operation in Dover stopped for good by 1940. Losing the mills hurt Dover deeply. Beyond the loss of economic security, Dover also lost its identity. It had been a mill town for well over a hundred years, and the vacant brick buildings were a haunting reminder of this loss. After the textile mills left town, shoe manufacturing became the number one industry. And as Dover's men and women were heading off to fight in World War II, Dover's factories were supplying the war effort with shoes, torpedo parts from Kidder Press, and a top-secret proximity fuse from the Sylvania Electric Plant, which was located in the old Pacific Mill. With the arrival of more businesses during and after the war, Dover's economic base slowly began to diversify. But it has taken a long time for Dover to absorb the painful memories of being an abandoned mill town. The railroad left town too. In 1967, the last passenger train passed through the city. Dover faced yet another challenge. While it struggled to diversify its economic base, it also needed to find a new identity. In the 1970s, as Dover's young men were returning home from Vietnam, Dover began moving again. It stepped into the national urban renewal trend with a $9 million project along the Cochico River, Central Avenue, Chestnut, and Washington Streets. Ironically, the urban renewal project was in the same place where Major Waldron had started one of Dover's earliest businesses. The Waldron Sawmill was located on the same site 350 years earlier and the Indian Massacre of 1689 also took place here. This area along the river on what was then Green Street had been neglected and was dilapidated. 
The project changed the face of the neighborhood dramatically. Yet Dover had the foresight to save several of the historic buildings in the area. The Trella and O'Neill houses are fine examples of the mill boarding houses from the 1830s. The old public market building was saved as well. And Dover's first central fire station, built in 1865 to house the city's first steam fire engine, is today a popular restaurant. Since the 70s, Dover has become one of the fastest growing areas in the country. So, as it still struggles to define a new identity, it also faces another challenge, growth. But these are challenges Dover has faced before. Dover's population is booming again. The city's resources are being strained again. And again, Dover needs to find ways to help newcomers become a part of the community. These ethnic groups are very proud of their past, and I think that we should listen to them and uh, remember what they went through as they came into this country and into this city. Stress the history of the past, uh, make it more important in the schools, heritage walks, and uh, I think that people have a greater interest in the city uh, by thinking in this direction. In order to get a sense of community, I think we're going to have to do a little searching as to what Dover means. What is Dover's identity? We're excited about newcomers coming into Dover. We think the growth is uh, exciting to be a part of. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's our belief that the downtown of a community such as Dover uh, represents the face of the community and that if the downtown is an interesting, exciting place to be with the arts and uh, various functions happening, that it will draw the type of person that uh, wants to uh, get involved in community affairs and participate. Dover has a long history of meeting challenges, wilderness survival, Indian fighting, wars, political strife, changing economics, and of course, growth. And over the years, all of these challenges were met by people who cared, people who invested in Dover, people who believed in the future. The Cochico River is once again becoming a source of pride. And in many ways, the river is a reflection of Dover. Unstoppable, it continues flowing into the future with energy, passion, beauty and grace. It finds its way around every obstacle. It prospers. And like the river, Dover is indeed rediscovering its identity. An identity brimming over with more than 365 years of history. And a precious, enduring partnership with the water. <laughs>